Okay, welcome back. We left off here with the very controversial figure these days of Christopher Columbus, an Italian mariner, a ship's captain, uh, who worked uh, famously for the Spanish government and discovered the New World, discovered in quotation marks. Uh, nonetheless, uh, Columbus gets a lot of attention today, uh, and he deserves a lot of attention uh, in history uh, for good uh, and bad, or good or bad. So, uh, Christopher Columbus, good guy or villain? Well, uh, uh, certainly uh, he's been seen as uh, representing the opening wedge of European colonization of the New World, and, he's, and he was that. Uh, and uh, you know, a colonization uh, which uh, ended up in the destruction of Native American cultures, the deaths of millions of Native Americans, most of it by diseases brought by Europeans, but plenty of it by violence uh, and uh, warfare, bloodshed, uh, enslavement of Native Americans, etc. But do keep in mind that Columbus didn't do all that himself. Uh, uh, he kind of uh, was the opening uh, uh, portion of the whole thing. Nonetheless, uh, uh, I do certainly understand uh, why Columbus uh, gets criticized today, uh, and uh, perhaps uh, it's deserved. The holiday uh, we have, Columbus Day, is criticized by many, particularly Native Americans and Native American groups today. Uh, that's uh, totally understandable as well. Perhaps we shouldn't have the holiday. Uh, but of course, uh, for our purposes here, uh, we need to know sort of why we hear so much about this guy uh, from sort of the, the more uh, historical perspective, not so much about what he uh, is seen to represent today. Uh, as uh, Alan Taylor, uh, a gifted historian, is one of Pulitzer Prize, used to uh, teach at UC Davis, nearby, uh, now he's at the University of Virginia, says in one of his books, the discovery and exploitation of the Americas and the route to Asia transformed Europe from a parochial backwater into the world's most dynamic and powerful continent. Really just another way to say uh, uh, something that uh, some of our previous quotes have already attested to. Uh, Columbus's uh, voyages and subsequent European colonization of the Americas uh, move the center of the world economy from the Indian Ocean to the Atlantic Ocean. Now, that deserves or needs some unpacking. It didn't literally, uh, and certainly not immediately, move the center of the world economy. Uh, but uh, what Columbus began, uh, right, the European exploitation and conquest of the New World by bloody violent force, uh, did in time cause... Uh, Euro the Europeans uh, to be able to turn the tables on that trade imbalance that we talked about earlier in the lecture in the last segment uh, so that uh, the trade imbalance was now either fair or equal or possibly even uh, in Europe's favor because once that once European uh, colonies sprang up the Spanish first uh, in the New World and then followed by the English the French the Dutch etc, uh, what you see is Europe going from have, having very few products and resources that people in the Indian Ocean trade desired to having a, a cornucopia of them. Uh, so just to pick a few uh, crops like sugar, tobacco, and coffee, uh, which didn't grow in the soil uh, and with the climate uh, in Europe, but did in the uh, New World, North and South America, at least in some parts of them, uh, and so once England or France or whoever had a colony uh, in a place, uh, an island like Jamaica, that uh, was perfect for uh, growing sugar uh, or uh, grow sugar cane or uh, uh, coffee beans, uh, now the Europeans, uh, uh, you know, by cultivating those crops on plantations, often with slave labor, uh, nonetheless, uh, it proved entirely lucrative because those three crops I picked out, and there are many others, uh, uh, coffee, uh, tobacco, sugar, are all, in one way or another, addictive. Uh, so uh, that uh, this gave the Europeans uh, products that everybody wanted, uh, because they're addictive. Uh, right? uh, that's why you see lines of cars uh, and waiting in the drive-thru at Starbucks. So uh, those three products alone... 
uh, became, uh, you know, entry tickets uh, to the Indian Ocean. Perhaps had Europeans done this earlier, stolen land uh, from Native Americans and put these crops in the ground, uh, they may have not had to go into the Indian Ar Ocean using armed trade methods, although they may still have done so anyway. Also uh, of great significance, the Spanish uh, laid down a, a gigantic empire uh, in both North and South America and spirited away, taking it from Native Americans, forcing Native Americans to do much of the labor, huge amounts of gold and silver, primarily the latter, uh, from uh, places in Mexico, primarily and Bolivia. Uh, and it just so happened when gold and silver were uh, uh, things that you could enter any trade relationship uh, around the world uh, because they were seen even then as they are now to have intrinsic value. But it just so happened that around the same time, by coincidence, China uh, based its whole monetary system on silver. So if the Chinese merchants... Uh, business people and others in the Indian Ocean had been reluctant to trade with Europeans before because the Europeans didn't have much stuff they wanted. That completely changed big time uh, once uh, the Europeans uh, conquered uh, you know, the Americas and took land from Native Americans, destroyed their cultures, killed uh, so many of them tragically and uh, uh, very inhumanely. Hence, back to the criticism uh, uh, and controversial nature of Columbus uh, uh, you know, and his doings uh, to this day. But Columbus uh, was in uh, many ways a salesman. Uh, he's known uh, for being the ship's captain uh, that uh, took ships across the uh, Atlantic uh, to sail west to try to get to uh, the uh, Indian Ocean, to Asia. Uh, but he had to sell the idea first. We should recognize also that Columbus wasn't the first or even close to being the first person to believe that the earth was round. All educated Europeans at the time knew it was round. His idea was simply, uh, since the earth is round, it logically follows that you should be able to go uh, east to get to Asia, as the Portuguese did, south and then east, around Africa, but east, uh, uh, just as uh, well, you should be able to go west uh, to get to Asia as well. And of course, he was right. Uh, but uh, uh, what he didn't know was that he was sailing uh, right towards uh, two uh, continents that no one except Native Americans who lived there knew existed. Uh, so Columbus, uh, we'll see, uh, happened onto uh, what we could call a lucky accident. Uh, so uh, these are simple uh, but world-changing uh, uh, events we're talking about. But this is a world-changing idea, uh, uh, and ironically, an accidental one, because remember, Columbus is trying to get to Asia and instead accidentally uh, runs into North and South America. And we just saw in the last slide uh, uh, how important uh, the, the discovery and then conquest of the Americas was uh, in terms of European wealth and power and ability to sort of rise uh, in terms of uh, you know, uh, power vis-a-vis -vis the rest of the world. Uh, so his idea, since the earth is round, it follows that one can theoretically reach Asia by sailing west as well as east, and I will do it. Uh, uh, and Columbus uh, does seem to have been a gifted salesman. I, I think of him actually primarily as a salesman. That's why I like this rather melod melodramatic picture, uh, uh, and it is melodramatic, but uh, it shows him presenting himself to the famous Ferdinand and Isabella, king, king and queen of Spain, uh, and uh, confidently pitching uh, his idea. Our textbook tells us that he unsuccessfully pitched the idea to the kings of Portugal, England, and France. So like a door-to-door -door salesman, he had some doors shut in his face, though some of them were impressed with Columbus, even though they turned him down, but he finally got a taker. Uh, in the Spanish monarchy, uh, who agreed to finance the voyage uh, and then find some other investors to finance the voyage for Columbus. So Columbus came in. He must have come in r rather confidently because it's not that it's not every day that someone who didn't come from a noble background, Columbus came from an average background, got in to be able uh, be able were able to get in to see the king and the queen of any country. So Columbus could not have walked in there. 
kind of fumbling and bumbling and you know looking sort of shy and embarrassed and you know uh, afraid to be there uh, he must have uh, uh, come in uh, with a great deal of confidence uh, he does appear to have probably had charisma as well uh, that sort of hard to pan down quality that sort of uh, uh, makes somebody uh, uh, an attractive personality uh, sort of uh, someone with an irresistible personality uh, and if you're a salesman it helps to have such a personality uh, so uh, he pitched the idea uh, that uh, uh, you know I will if you know if you guys can finance uh, me uh, I will set out to the west uh, and we'll get to uh, Asia a different way uh, and uh, uh, you know um, Spain will benefit there the Spanish king and queen figured I think correctly that uh, it's not that much of an investment from their perspective since they're rich monarchs uh, and so if they lose out uh, uh, not that big of a deal uh, and if uh, Columbus somehow uh, you know, succeeds and uh, sets up a very lucrative trade uh, in a, from a different direction with Asia uh, they could stand uh, to make big gains uh, uh, as they did in the end but again through an accident because Columbus's lucky uh, accident uh, was tripping over North and South America, uh, and we've seen how lucrative that ended up being. So instead of uh, establishing uh, you know, very uh, uh, profit, uh, large profit-making relations uh, with Asia from Columbus's first and subsequent voyages, he made four voyages, uh, they uh, uh, were able to benefit from colonizing and conquering uh, Native American lands in North and South America, and that probably was better economically for Spain than the other Europeans that followed them to the Americas uh, than uh, you know uh, trade across the Pacific. Uh, uh, once uh, somebody went around uh, the tip of South America, in this case, into the Pacific and on to Asia, which is a great distance indeed. Uh, so the voyage, the first one in 1492, you see pictured here with only three small ships. Uh, it was so significant in history because, again, it, it's sort of the beginning uh, of uh, a huge tidal wave of European expansion and colonization and conquest of the Americas uh, and was uh, consequential in extremely negative ways for Native Americans, destruction of their cultures and stealing of their land and killing off of large numbers of their people. Uh, but for Europeans, as we've already noted, I'm repeating myself, but uh, it bears repeating, uh, this ended up being uh, uh, lucrative to the point that Europe, uh, in a due course in time, became uh, kind of the center of the European uh, economy, uh, no longer on the periphery. Uh, uh, the opening wedge uh, you know, put in place by Columbus. So three ships, 90 crew. He first hit the Bahamas uh, in October of 1492, then uh, explored some of the other islands framing the Caribbean Ocean and Sea. The Bahamas isn't a bad place to hit, by the way. If you're just sort of accidentally running into uh, land, uh, a vacation resort isn't a bad place to you know, luck into landing. Uh, without hitting the Americas uh, by accident, all of Columbus's crew and Columbus himself would have certainly died at sea because he had underestimated uh, the distance from Europe to Asia, uh, putting it at about where he ran into uh, the North and uh, South American continents. Uh, so uh, if there weren't any continents there, uh, his ships were running out of food and water uh, and so uh, there was no way they would have made it to Asia. So uh, he was himself darn lucky uh, that he uh, had sort of accidentally uh, hit land. The first Native American group that he came across, the Taino Indians, uh, uh, sort of the, then the first Native uh, peoples, indigenous peoples, uh, to bear the brunt of Spanish uh, or European colonization, certainly, certainly not the last, uh, show us sort of what would, well, you know, a sign of, the, were a sign of things to come. Uh, uh, this uh, was the establishment of the brutal model for Native Americans throughout Spain's eventual sprawling empire, and to some degree, again, the other Europeans, like the English and the Dutch, uh, that came a little bit later. By 1494, one Spanish official reported that 50,000 had died uh, in the Caribbean, 
uh, saying they are falling each day like cattle in an infected herd. Again, because part of that was from disease. Uh, the, the largest part was from disease. Uh, but again, some from warfare and brutal uh, conditions, enslavement of Native peoples as well. Uh, Professor Taylor, who I just quoted, says most Indians died of disease, but this was compounded by callous exploitation by, quote, forced labor on colonial mines, ranches, and plantations where they suffered a brutal work regimen. They faced raids on villages uh, that resisted. Dislocated, traumatized, overworked, and underfed, they proved especially vulnerable to disease. So uh, this ended up being an absolute nightmare uh, for Native Americans uh, and a, a, a real uh, and gigantic tragedy. The overall view of Columbus uh, and the Spanish, as well as you know, the other Europeans that follow uh, toward Native peoples, uh, uh, was also sort of seen from the beginning here. Uh, Columbus, as Taylor says, unilaterally declared the natives, uh, Indians, subject to the Spanish crown. I mean, as soon as he sort of uh, you know, made his presence known, as you see in dramatic fashion here, another melodramatic painting, uh, he just sort of assumed uh, that that automatically meant any people that live here are all automatically under my king and queen's uh, power and control. Uh, and uh, uh, you know, it's a big assumption to make. Uh, he goes on to write, the colonial enterprise arrived in the Americas in Columbus's mind. Uh, from the start, uh, he treated the Caribbean islands and their inhabitants as places and people to be rendered into commercial plantations worked by forced labor. He rationalized that such treatment would benefit the Indians by exposing them to Christian salvation and Hispanic civilization. Uh, to unpack that, uh, what does it mean? Uh, he's saying that uh, he, he, he uh, explained or justified uh, the way Native Americans were treated so harshly uh, because it would, uh, you know, even though the, the labor was extremely harsh, this is, this is his way, an attempt by him to justify it. Uh, uh, forced labor and, and you know, enslaved conditions would benefit the Indians uh, because it, it would expose them to Christianity uh, and to uh, civilization. Uh, Hispanic and European civilization. Uh, this is actually, uh, for a number of centuries, even after this, uh, a, a typical uh, justification used by Europeans uh, to try to, you know, claim uh, some of them clearly believed uh, that uh, uh, you know they were doing something moral and not something deeply immoral. Though I think uh, we uh, believe differently looking back on it today. Uh, Columbus himself talking about the first peoples that uh, he met in the Caribbean, uh, uh, referred to them as so very cowardly that a thousand would not stand against three armed Spaniards. And so they are fit to be ordered about and made to work, plant, and do everything else that may be needed. Uh, uh, basically saying uh, the uh, these people are so cowardly, and in some cases so nice and friendly. The first group, the Tainos that we looked at a minute ago, uh, uh, were very peace-loving people. They hadn't known warfare before, probably because they were isolated on an island and had rarely, if ever, fought wars. Uh, and they swam out to greet Columbus's uh, uh, you know, sailors uh, and brought them gifts and were very welcoming. Columbus writes that in his diary. Uh, but then just sort of below that in the same diary, uh, says they're so nice and so cowardly uh, that with like three guys, we could sort of just roll them. Uh, and of course, that's what he planned to do, and that's what the, he did do. So you can see why and how Columbus gets villainized today. Uh, however, keep in mind he certainly was not alone. Uh, uh, sadly, it was sort of the, that was sort of the common way uh, for not just the Spanish but for Europeans to think about uh, uh, Native Americans, uh, uh, you know, that many centuries ago. The Columbian Exchange. Sounds like a, a movie about, you know, drug, a big drug deals or something. Uh, it's a bit more mundane than that, but certainly far more important uh, than uh, such uh, a movie. Uh, Taylor again saying, in effect, the post-Columbian exchange uh, depleted people on one side of the Atlantic while swelling those on the European and African side. That's a fancy way of saying uh, that this exchange 
uh, as you can see here, of plants, and you can't see here, animals. So an exchange of flora and fauna from the old world to the new, from Europe to the Americas and back again, in the end benefited the Europeans far more than it benefited Native Americans. Uh, so the Spanish uh, and other European empires uh, had uh, all kinds of effects on other people, and uh, some of it was uh, the negative effects of uh, living things, plants and animals, germs uh, uh, that are living things uh, brought over. Uh, Alfred Crosby, an historian, wrote a book called The Columbian Exchange in the 70s, uh, talked about the brutality, forced labor, and its demoralizing impact on Native peoples. Every peso coin minted in Potosi, which is in Bolivia, has cost the life of 10 Indians. Nature's inequitable Colombian exchange uh, was a biological revolution. Uh, so the the precious metals, silver primarily, that uh, were uh, mined and minted uh, at Potosi cost the lives of many Native peoples uh, indeed. Europeans got a new continent. Uh, Native Americans got smallpox, Crosby goes on to say. Uh, so again, the diseases that Europeans brought that count as living things if you add those to the equation, then it's really, really one-sided in terms of who benefited uh, and who paid uh, uh, in the Colombian exchange. Both sides got uh, uh, you know, a combination of uh, uh, benefits and costs from it, but uh, Europeans got mostly benefits, Native Americans got mostly costs. Uh, the Pleistocene extinctions, uh, as they're known, approximately uh, 13,000 years ago, uh, left uh, uh, the Americas with very few uh, uh, mammals, uh, particularly uh, mammals that could be domesticated into livestock. Uh, they had existed prior to those extinctions uh, that were created by uh, changing climate conditions. Uh, but afterwards, and by the time Europeans arrived, the Native Americans uh, hadn't uh, had domesticated uh, animals. In fact, the, that Pleistocene extinction uh, happened, you know, right around the time Native Americans first arrived uh, in the Americas. So they basically uh, were uh, didn't have domesticable animals since they had first arrived thousands of years before. Uh, Neo-Europeans uh, re recreated their uh, environment with familiar crops, animals, uh, so uh, brought their horses, their pigs, their wheat, their rye, and their weeds unintentionally with the weeds Probably seeds caught on some sailor or soldier's boots uh, you know, from Seville, Spain, that gets uh, you know falls off his boot when he jumps off uh, in Mex Mexico or Peru, uh, and now that weed uh, is uh, you know in the ground uh, and starts to spread uh, in Peru. And okay, so what? How do weeds have an impact on history? Well, like diseases, uh, uh, plants uh, weeds are plants, uh, they, they build up uh, evolutionary defenses against other plants so that they can survive. Uh, but this happens through the process of natural selection and uh, you know, long-term evolution. Uh, and so the weeds that were brought by the Europeans, uh, uh, the uh, plants uh, that deal with weeds and have to try to fend them off, uh, that were native to indigenous to the Americas had no defenses against these weeds because they were of a different kind and operated differently. So uh, even weeds uh, could and did uh, take their toll uh, on uh, landscapes uh, or ecosystems uh, in the New World. So even weeds uh, uh, hurt Native Americans. Uh, and all of this led to, uh, as it's sometimes been called, economic imperialism. Uh, from uh, also coming from uh, Alfred Crosby's book, from Argentina to Texas, cattle, pigs, and sheep ran off, went wild, bred herds, millions strong, and took over the plains. The deadly impact of microbes, which Native peoples uh, had no resistance to, 90% sort of uh, people uh, everywhere uh, in Native America dead within 50 to 100 years of European arrival. So uh, that's, of course, the biggest thing here uh, and the, the, the biggest uh, calamity here. But uh, even the Europeans bringing their pigs and their sheep uh, oftentimes hurt Native American ecosystems as well. 
if you've ever been around sort of large scale hog farms, uh, you can really, uh, 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 they can really mess up the, the environment uh, in a big way. Uh, uh, and Europeans on the other side, you can see from the picture, got the benefit uh, of, we already mentioned, uh, of crops like uh, coffee, uh, uh, sugar, uh, tobacco, uh, vanilla, uh, as you see here, cocoa, rubber, uh, but also the, the first three there, uh, maize or corn, and the tomato and the potato. Uh, those three, uh, right, all of which we have in our diets uh, uh, significantly today, uh, didn't even exist in Europe uh, until uh, this exchange until Europeans uh, and Native Americans met up and Europeans conquered uh, and extracted resources like silver and gold, but also took crops that they thought might grow uh, in Europe. Uh, and sure enough, all three of those grew extremely well in Europe. It revolutionized uh, Europeans' diets uh, in a positive way. Life expectancy and population started to grow uh, a century or two after this, and some historians think it had a lot to do with the, the potato being introduced there for the first time. So uh, another example of how this is uh, this Colombian exchange is very one-sided in favor of Europeans. The native peoples of the Americas didn't get you know crops like this uh, that they hadn't had before that benefited them. Uh, one disease may have gone the other way. There's still some debate about this, but it looks like syphilis uh, had originated in the Americas and made it to, to Europe uh, only uh, after these two groups uh, come into contact uh, through you know, the first contact uh, we get, we're talking about in this unit uh, and the Colombian exchange. So, the, so there's a global revolutionary impact from this exchange. Uh, uh, the Colombian exchange allowed Europeans to trade many commodities for the first time. As we know, uh, this is really a repeat of what I've already been saying, uh, that were in great global demand, uh, corrected that earlier trade imbalance that we saw. So the things that you can see from this uh, map and chart that they're taking uh, uh, from the Americas back to Europe uh, are now uh, uh, helping um, the Europeans in many ways. And this doesn't even include, of course, non-living resources like the gold and the silver, <coughs> which is even more valuable in terms of uh, monetary value. We now turn to the Europeans uh, uh, navigating uh, the waters of the Pacific Ocean uh, and begin with Ferdinand Magellan's famous voyage, uh, his uh, the, the first circumnavigation of the globe, meaning the first uh, uh, ships, uh, the first voyage around the world ever. Uh, and this sort of was the beginning of the opening of the Pacific Ocean to uh, you know uh, world trade. Uh, remember, this whole unit is about these kind of global connections uh, through uh, trans-oceanic voyages. So uh, a lot of that has already been done, but Magellan uh, uh, sort of is the marks sort of the beginning of a new stage uh, whereby there's true globalization, globalization of trade and ideas from this point forward, because now it's possible to go all the way around the world. Uh, I mean, it's been done, and they know how, how to get there and what to expect along the way. Uh, Magellan uh, believed that the uh, spice, island, uh, uh, spice Islands and Asian markets lay fairly close to the western coast of the Americas, uh, and he decided to pursue Christopher Columbus's goal of establishing a western route to Asian waters. Remember, Columbus was trying to get to Asia uh, and uh, uh, got tripped up in the Americas. Columbus went to his deathbed, apparently, claiming that he had found Asia. Uh, right? We get the term Indians for Native Americans because uh, he believed and others uh, along with him from Spain that uh, they had been, uh, they had landed in Asia. Whether or, not, whether or not on his deathbed, Columbus really still believed that, was just too proud to admit that he hadn't gotten where he had you know, said he was going to go, uh, where he was getting paid to go, uh, it's hard to know. Uh, but in a sense, Magellan is kind of picking up now, uh, and uh, uh, like Columbus, uh, Magellan uh, worked for the Spanish because uh, they paid for the, the voyage, uh, and Magellan was himself Portuguese. So the Spanish uh, were uh, good at hiring uh, you know, sea captains from other countries to do 
uh, uh, service for Spain. Uh, so uh, Magellan's voyage, uh, as our textbook says, Bentley and Ziegler, was an exercise in endurance. At times, crewmen survived on worm-ridden biscuits, leather that they had softened in the ocean, and water gone foul. Ships, rats that were unfortunate enough to fall into the hands of famished sailors quickly became the centerpiece of a meal. Uh, that tells you how hungry they must have been if they uh, are eating rats uh, on the trip. Uh, Magellan didn't even make it uh, around the world on the voyage that still bears his name. He only made it about halfway. He died in the Philippines uh, in very strange circumstances. That's a fascinating story, but I don't have time to get into it. Uh, uh, but not a wise decision on his part that led to his own death. Uh, but since he's the famous guy that started the voyage, uh, or at least was the you know the most high-ranking uh, social figure on board, uh, he still got the credit for it. Uh, he only made it halfway. The guys who deserve the credit for actually circumnavigating the globe are the 18 survivors uh, on one ship that returned to Europe, uh, of uh, uh, the original five ships with 280 men, including Magellan. So only 18 of 280 made it back, uh, but they those 18 could actually say we were the first people to go all the way around the world by ship you know, and actually return to where we started. But this started the ball rolling to uh, uh, opening of trade across uh, the Pacific and around the world. Uh, and one of the things that Magellan's voyage led to uh, was the uh, Spanish conquest of the Philippines. Uh, Magellan didn't survive, but the Spanish uh, kind of left, uh, it, it had a lasting impact on the Philippines and actually conquered it and made it a colony. Uh, as uh, the lovable uh, professors uh, that, are, that our textbooks say, Spanish forces approached the Philippines in 1565 under the command of Miguel Lopez uh, Legazpi. Legazpi overcame uh, local authorities in Cebu and Manila in almost bloodless contests uh, because the Philippines had no central government. There was no organized resistance to the intrusion. Uh, Spanish forces faced a series of small, disunited chiefdoms, most of which soon fell before the Spanish ships and guns. So because the Philippines' uh, social organization uh, uh, was sort of split up and decentralized, not one kingdom ruled by one king and one leader on government, uh, they were more susceptible to being conquered uh, because they hadn't united and didn't have one national army. Uh, they had a bunch of small armies uh, uh, you know, in these small chiefdoms, and the Spanish kind of attacked them one at a time and took them down. Spanish policy in the Philippines, they go on to say, revolved around trade and Christianity. Manila soon emerged as a bustling multicultural port city, an entrepot for trade, particularly in silk, and it quickly became the hub of Spanish commercial activity in Asia. Uh, Spanish rulers and missionaries pressured prominent Filipinos to convert to Christianity uh, in hopes of persuading others to follow their example. They opened schools to teach the fundamentals of Christian doctrine, along with basic literacy. Uh, but they encountered stiff resistance, uh, particularly in highland, uh, uh, you know, rural regions. But over the long term, uh, Filipinos turned increasingly to Christianity. And by the 19th century, the Philippines had become one of the most fervent Roman Catholic uh, lands in the entire world, which is still uh, basically true uh, to this day. One, the Philippines is one of the largest Catholic countries uh, in the in the world in terms of population size. Uh, but uh, this uh, is one of the long-lasting, uh, uh, you know, long-term results of Magellan's uh, circumnavigation, uh, and it shows that the Europeans already by the middle of the 16th century had come across the Pacific and, and were now making an impact from the other side of the, the uh, world, the other side of Asia, uh, on Asia itself. But many others uh, began to explore uh, as well, like uh, with the Atlantic or our look at the Atlantic, we fast forward ahead a little bit so to see uh, that this process continued and got bigger and bi bigger. Our textbook uh, talks about the expeditions of a guy named Vitus Bering, uh, who uh, also was a foreigner working for a, a different a, another government. Uh, Bering was from Denmark, 
but his famous voyages uh, were done uh, under the leadership of Russia. They were paying him. He's the first explorer sent out by a European government uh, to explore and scientifically investigate relatively unknown parts of the globe. So it became quite common uh, uh, after this. I don't know if the others learned from what the Russians did here uh, or they just had the same ideas. Uh, but uh, th this is sort of the first of many European expeditions to one part of the world or another uh, to gather information. Uh, uh, again, like the Portuguese had done, you know, uh, by this time, a century and a half before uh, or more uh, in collecting information, uh, knowledge, kind of intel, intelligence to benefit themselves uh, and to benefit their empires. Uh, Russian officials, according to Bentley and Ziegler, Ziegler commissioned the Danish navigator Bering uh, to undertake two maritime expeditions. Uh, the dates sort of jumbled there. Uh, uh, at least the first expedition, in search of a northeast passage to Asian ports. Bering sailed through the icy Arctic Ocean uh, in the Bering Strait, which bears his name, of course, uh, which uh, separates Siberia from Alaska and reconnoitered northern Asia as far as the Kamchatka Peninsula. Uh, Kamchatka of Risk fame. Uh, in, if you ever played the, the old game Risk, uh, Kamchatka is the key. Uh, Kamchatka, Kamchatka, Kamchatka. <laughs> uh, I still remember it from my younger days. Kamchatka was always sort of a strategic uh, spot uh, of a great importance in risk. By 1800, Russian mariners were scouting the Pacific Ocean as far as as far south as the Hawaiian Islands. Uh, Professor McNeil, who I've quoted before here, said Russian fur traders speedily followed up Bering's discoveries in Alaska by establishing trading posts, first in the Aleutian Islands, uh, which kind of off the coast of uh, Africa, I'm sorry, uh, Alaska and Asia in the Pacific, uh, and then uh, on the mainland. Uh, so uh, the Russians would go on to have a presence, mainly in fur trading uh, in Alaska, Canada, even down as far as Northern California over time. So uh, uh, to some degree bearing uh, laid the groundwork for that with his early exploring, uh, uh, you know, information gathering expeditions. Also, uh, and even more famous uh, to Westerners, uh, were the voyages of Captain Cook, uh, James Cook. Three uh, famous voyages in the latter half of the uh, 18th century. Uh, uh, our authors say Cook charted uh, Eastern Australia and New Zealand. Uh, and uh, he added New Caledonia, Vanuatu, and Hawaii to European maps of the Pacific. He probed the frigid waters of the Arctic Ocean and spent months at a time in the tropical islands of Tahiti, Tonga, and Hawaii, where he showed deep interest in the manner, customs, uh, and languages of Polynesian peoples. By the time Cook's voyages had come to an end, European geographers had compiled a reasonably accurate understanding of the world's uh, ocean basins, their lands, and their peoples. So again, uh, part of this type, kind of exploring funded by the governments, in this case the English government, uh, was done uh, out of curiosity and uh, uh, scholarly interest, uh, but uh, it was also done uh, so uh, that you know, if it's important to map the world, uh, uh, maybe just in general, but governments uh, thought uh, mapping the world uh, accurately will also help us to sort of gain advantages if we go to war or establish colonies or see where the important trade lanes. And uh, so the more w you know, we know about the world's geography, the better it is for us. We can turn that knowledge to our advantage. So this is the primary reason that the government pays guys like uh, uh, Captain Cook or the Russians uh, uh, paid Vitus Bering. Uh, Cook was an interesting figure. Uh, uh, today he'd be uh, kind of a head scratcher of a person uh, because uh, as Arthur Herman says in a really good book called To Rule the Waves, uh, that Cook had no illusions about what the future held for the Tahitians uh, while he was in Tahiti. Uh, the most obliging and benevolent people I ever met with, he said. Uh, uh, but he realized their culture was fragile uh, after the Europeans arrived. Quote, we introduce among them wants and perhaps diseases which they never before knew. 
uh, he wrote sadly, and which serve only to disturb that happy tranquility they and their forefathers enjoyed. Better, he decided, that Europeans had never appeared at all. Uh, and uh, yet, uh, while in Tahiti, uh, uh, there was so much uh, cultural misunderstanding between the Tahitians uh, and uh, the English and other European sailors on board uh, that you know, now you know, living or at least residing for the time that they were there uh, on, you know, at Tah on Tahiti, uh, that uh, there was some uh, stealing of property uh, of, from the English by the Tahitians. The Tahitians had different views about property. It wasn't uncommon for someone to just walk into somebody else's dwelling and just take something and sort of that's my own. They didn't they didn't value private property the way the Europeans did. And so when this happened to Europeans, they considered it an insult uh, and a crime. And so uh, eventually uh, Cook didn't know what to do and got frustrated and had uh, some of the uh, Tahitians flogged uh, and punished uh, uh, for crimes. And so uh, I, I think that statement there, uh, the quotes. I mean, Arthur Herman uh, included as a quote, you know, his own comments on it uh, in that last uh, piece there uh, of writing. Uh, but it seems to me, and I've read some of Captain Cook's writings, you know, in more complete form, all of it. But it seems to me he really did uh, have an understanding uh, uh, of you know the way Europeans were going to likely destroy the culture in the future uh, of peoples like this, and you know the, the Tahitians specifically. Uh, and he really did seem to be unhappy about it, lamented it, uh, and he did seem to be genuinely interested uh, in their cultures and thought these are wonderful people, benevolent, obliging, as he says in his own words. And yet, in the end, uh, he committed uh, 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 you know, certain what could be called crimes, uh, violent acts against them as well. Uh, uh, although a lot of this is through cultural misunderstanding. So to me, he's a great example of how uh, it's difficult uh, to take historical figures uh, and know what we're supposed to think of them today in a moral sense. So we just sort of think of Cook as a bad guy because uh, of the you know, negative things he did uh, or as a good guy uh, because of how uh, genuinely uh, you know, uh, interesting, interested he, he was in Tahitian and other people's uh, cultures uh, and how much uh, respect he had for them. Uh, overall, uh, it's a difficult call uh, uh, to know uh, uh, sort of what we're to make uh, of uh, you know those two things that kind of cut in a different direction.